Great. Well, thank you for that, Alexis, and uh, really appreciate you all joining us today. This officially is the start of Invasive Species Awareness Week, which is a national event, um, but also the uh, Governor Inslee, the governor of Washington State, proclaimed Invasive Species Awareness Week uh, it, in uh, kind of in solidarity with the national event. And we've scheduled a, a week-long series of events uh, that are virtual, that uh, will uh, raise awareness of invasive species, as well as uh, help educate uh, the public about the role that they play. And in Washington, invasive species threaten our economy, our environment, our recreation, even our human health. And we all have a role to play to stop them and to prevent them from moving uh, into our state and damaging what we know and love. And the bottom line is, if you see something, say something. And uh, what we're trying to educate everyone about is to be aware of invasive species that are either just becoming established in Washington or, uh, or on the verge of entering Washington. And if you see something, say something. Report it to the Invasive Species Council and um, we can get it to the correct response agency to then take action. And I'm um, really am happy to be bringing this series to you. Uh, if you're not aware of the other events that we have going on this week, please visit invasivespecies.wa.gov. And we've got a link right on the homepage that will take you to the Awareness Week information. Uh, we know how to stop invasive species, but the catch is that it takes all of us to be successful. And so we thank you for partnering with us and together we will stop invasive species. Back to you, Alexis. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I hope you were here for the feral swine webinar today. <laughs> That's the one that we're going to be talking a little bit more about. Um, and like Justin said, if you haven't had the chance, please check out our social. But at this time, I am happy to hand the presentation over um, to Brooke and Justin Bush. Brooke is here with us on behalf of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Okay, thanks, Alexis. Yeah, my um, pleasure. Uh, well, everybody, this is the first time for me doing one of these presentations, so hopefully it goes smooth and um, we'll see how I do. Uh, again, my name is Brooke Shiley. I'm a district supervisor for the United States Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services Program, um, and I'm, uh, I manage all our activities uh, west of the Cascades. All right, next slide, Justin. So just uh, a little bit about who we are, if uh, people out there don't know, obviously we're the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Ag Agriculture. We're under the agency, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which is APHIS and our program is Wildlife Services. Um, our mission is actually to provide federal leadership and uh, expertise to resolve wildlife damage issues. Um, you know, so the reducing conflicts so that wildlife and people can coexist uh, without issues. Um, and we have a operational branch, which I am a supervisor over. And then we also have um, our regional offices uh, in the East and the West. And then we have a National Wildlife Research Center um, and its field stations scattered throughout the country as well. The, the main wildlife research center is in Fort Collins, Colorado. All right, next slide, Justin. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, a, a brief uh, background on the feral swine program. Um, in March 2014, Congress appropriated $20 million to USDA APHIS uh, feral swine program. So, this is APHIS in general, not necessarily just wildlife services, although we get a lot uh, for operational work on the ground. Um, and the primary goal of this was to minimize damage caused by feral swine. Uh, to protect agriculture, livestock, natural resources, property, and human health and safety. Um, the goals to uh, get this accomplished were, you know, number one, suppressing populations in states where feral swine populations are large and widely distributed. So a lot of the southern uh, states and some of the north, uh, eastern, or midwestern states. Um, and then eliminate feral swine in states where populations are low or newly emerging. So uh, states like Utah or Washington's a good example where uh, as these populations are uh, found or reported, uh, we try to get in as quickly as possible and just eliminate uh, those animals so that they don't spread. Um, and 
in this is led uh, by wildlife services through the National uh, Feral Swine Damage Management Program, uh, which is a separate program dealing solely with feral swine in the United States. Okay, next slide, Justin. Um, so uh, what, do you, what do you think of typically when you think of feral swine? So these are some pretty good uh, pictures of, of what is a typical feral swine that we see around the country, uh, wild pig. Um, these elongated snouts, you know, obviously the hair is uh, uh, very bristly and thick um, and, and typically they're exhibiting tusks. Um, and then of course, you know, they go by all different names. So, you know, wild boar, wild hog, Russian boar, Eurasian boar. Uh, the one that we always get a kick out of is the piney woods rooter. So, um, <laughs> you know, they can go by anything depending on what part of the country you're from. All right. But then, you know, what about these guys? So, uh, yeah, they're, they're swine, but these, these aren't uh, exhibiting uh, um, feral uh, traits. Uh, these are just domestic swine that have, have gotten out of the pen or weren't pinned properly. Uh, but one thing, you know, I think about is uh, it only takes two generations for domestic pigs uh, to become fully feral. So uh, free roaming pigs that get loose, uh, it doesn't take them long till you begin to, um, their offspring begin to uh, re-exhibit uh, these feral uh, swine qualities, the tusks, the thick, thicker hair, and then their, their snouts begin to elongate. Um, next slide, Justin. Um, so this is a, a good slide just to kind of give an idea of, of distribution of feral swine over time and, and the expanse across the country. Um, as you can see in the 80s, you know, there, there could be questions about maybe there just wasn't documentation and, and that's possible. But for the most part, we had feral swine in the southern parts of the state and then out in California. Um, and then by 2004, you can see that it just starts to increase northward. And until we get to the um, in there in uh, 2017, where, you know, almost every state has had a at least one population of feral swine. Um, so, uh, again, this is, is uh, mainly due to in intentional translocation, so people relocating these animals for hunting purposes. Um, another uh, way they, they do spread is uh, escaped. Uh, they escape from farms and hunting operations. Um, it's very hard to fence in a pig because of their behaviors, their rooting behaviors. It's very easy for a pig, um, especially in the right soil type, to simply root under a fence. Um, and then obviously breeding um, with free ranging domestic pigs is a huge issue. Um, a, a lot of times a, a single Eurasian type boar will be released with other domestic pigs, uh, you know, just to get a population started initially. Um, and then they have pro prolific breeding behavior. So um, about eight months uh, is the range uh, when a pig can begin to um, breed. So um, it's a short time frame, uh, you know, only eight months, and then the sow can begin to have uh, offspring. And in the right environments, they can have um, two litters a year. Okay, Justin. So here's some of the damage. Um, uh, that they cause or the sign that you see. Um, and as you can see, the, the damage can be significant. So um, the one at the monument there, that can occur in a single night, uh, you know, with a sounder of 20 pigs. Uh, they can just devastate green areas, uh, croplands, um, and, and habitat in general um, if, if they're really going um, into some serious rooting behavior. And as you can see, just uh, some of the damages, even even as uh, at residential areas, so you'll get pigs that come into residential areas and just root up lawns and gardens, and you know one day it's fine when you go to bed, and then you come out the next morning and your lawn is just completely killed over. Um, and then obviously the damage to the crops can be severe, uh, particularly crops like peanuts um, and rice can suffer some severe damage as well. 
um, from them coming in and rooting. Um, rice has other issues since there's water, they, they uh, um, wallow a lot. So they roll around in that mud and they can uh, cause some serious damage in some of those agricultural fields. Okay, Justin, next slide. So these are the Washington regulations kind of discussing swine because, um, you know, as we talked about feral swine, well, what about these free roaming domestic pigs? How, how are those handled? It's, it's one thing if it's, if it's truly a feral swine that is uncontrolled and not owned by anybody, but it's totally different if it's, if it's livestock that is owned by a Washington resident, but is maybe just free roaming. So some of these rules um, basically try to um, pull out feral swine so that, you know, basically the state can take action against these uh, invasive animals. Um, but also you will see in there that it says swine from domestic stock that have escaped or been released born into the wild state are also included um, in that. So um, free roaming uh, livestock or pigs can be deemed um, uh, feral or invasive and can be removed if it, if if we need to go that far. But typically we work closely with the local law enforcement uh, animal control uh, to help these people just get their pigs uh, pinned up. All right, Justin, next slide. So outreach, um, this is, you know, we try to get the word out and this is one example of it. Uh, we we uh, try to come to all these invasive uh, council meetings, plus any other invasive workshops or feral swine workshops, uh, either here in Washington or elsewhere um, in the nation. Uh, just giving information on feral swine, the damage that is caused, um, as well as uh, the hotline uh, that you can call to report the pigs, which is very important at, you know, for us to get that information so we can go out and investigate these issues. Um, and, and that's through the Invasive Species Council. You can see over there the uh, flyer, and I think there's a slide later where we uh, will look at the uh, flyer. So next slide, Justin. So yeah, here, here, here are all the contact information. So the Invasive Species Council um, uh, put out this um, report feral swine uh, flyer, and it has, um, <clears throat> it has their logo down at the bottom, uh, as well as our uh, uh, our APHIS website uh, to talk about feral swine, but this 1-800 number will come to the to Washington State. And then um, what happens is WDFW then uh, gives those reports to APHIS Wildlife Services, and we go out and investigate um, or look into uh, that report, whether it's uh, uh, a domestic pig, or even a report that it may be a pig, we go out to confirm if it is indeed a pig, how many they are, and what we think. Are, are they just loose domestics? Can we find the owner? Um, and then we talk about if, if at that point no owner can be found, we talk about going in and doing a uh, removal. Um, squeal on pigs is, a, is the uh, uh, also uh, a little pamphlet that gets handed out. And then I think, um, I'm not quite sure of this, so I apologize, but I think that is um, WDFW's uh, like website. Maybe Justin, could you speak on that? Because I, I don't really know and I don't want to say anything incorrect. Thank you for that invitation. Uh, yes, that, that's correct. Uh, it's uh, actually the Washington Invasive Species Council's reporting app. It's called Washington Invasives, and you can find it in the Google Play Store or the Apple Store if you have one of those devices. And um, it functions as a great field guide, so you can download it and kind of forget about it until you need that, that resource. Uh, but you can also file a report via the app uh, using a GPS location, and then also include a photo if you happen to snap one before the pig runs away, for example. Um, but that's available for free. And uh, thanks, Burke. I appreciate that. Go ahead. No, very good. I didn't, I didn't want to say anything incorrect. So excellent. So that is a great resource, and I think it, it, it allows for quick reporting and, th and that's good because the quicker we can get out there, obviously the better. Uh, if somebody sees a pig and, and then, you know, we don't, uh, we aren't notified for months later, the likelihood of that animal still being there, especially if it is a wild animal is uh, unlikely. So great resources for reporting. All right, next slide. Okay, so this is a, 
uh, we'll go back to the beginning of 2014 and, and to kind of go through a map of the reports uh, just to show that you know the the reporting has increased and it's actually uh, looking really well. Um, so in 2014, we only had seven reports, um, and obviously, as you can see, they're all basically along the, uh, the I-5 corridor there. Um, next slide, please. So in 2015, you begin to see we we get. Uh, Five reports. We actually removed four um, four feral swine uh, in the potholes area um, out by Moses Lake. Um, and as you can see, the reports begin to now filter out. So in a year, we begin to get reports on the uh, eastern side of the state. All right, next slide, Justin. So in 2016, uh, 16 reports. Uh, we actually removed uh, 12 uh, pigs. Um, uh, and some of these were actually mo removed from um, not only just the potholes area, but from Gifford Pinchot uh, National Forest. Um, and then we also assisted with fencing in Okanagan um, in an effort to help a landowner contain his, his feral swine. So, um, you know, we, we are willing to assist and help uh, landowners, um, you know, repair fencing or uh, help them design a better fence system to keep these pigs in because, you know, we understand people want livestock, they just can't be getting out. Um, 27, or next slide, please, Justin. So in 2017, we get 10 reports. Uh, we removed nine uh, feral swine, and uh, all, all of those pigs were, again, removed from the potholes area. Um, but as you can see, the reports in those areas begin to, to branch out, and that's that's a little unnerving as those reports in the same area begin to branch out because then you wonder if those pigs are moving. Um, but in this case, that wasn't occurring. Um, okay, uh, next slide, yep. 2018, um, eight reports, we removed six pigs. Um, and this was a, a repeat in Okanagan uh, area. Um, and uh, the swine were removed after a landowner vacated the property and left the, the, his livestock there, basically, and they were getting out of the uh, fenced area that we had. Okay, next slide. So in 2019, we get 12, uh, 12, um, 12 reports. We remove eight. Um, Uh, we did remove a very large pig. It was about a 300 pound pig um, in a noxious weed plot on the Kitsap Peninsula. Um, it had been roaming free for a couple of years. It, it was a, a domestic breed, but the animal was obviously feral. Um, and it had been reported uh, by, the, by other property owners, you know, for several years that pig had been damaging their property. Um, and it wasn't until they found out that they could actually report that to the state and something could be done that they did that and we were able to go out and actually remove that pig. Um, and it, it worked out really well and the landowners were really happy because they were sustaining lots of damage over the past couple of years from just that rooting behavior. Um, but it was a single pig, um, no offspring and, and no other uh, no, no other uh, members in the cylinder. Okay, the next slide, Justin. So this is 2020. Um, we had 13 reports. We removed one uh, pig. Um, we had several reports in a couple different counties, and uh, I, I think it was Snohomish County, and it might have both of them might have been in Snohomish. It was either Snohomish County and King County, or both cases in Snohomish County. We actually uh, worked with local animal control uh, to try to get those um, loose livestock. Uh, back in their pen and in one case just to show you the the scale um one case we counted 24 feral swine that were you know not pinned so we're not just talking one or two pigs uh it was a substantial number of pigs and and that is uh that is a concern when there's that many even though they're domestic uh roaming free okay Um, so, not all reports that we get are actionable. Um, uh, you know, sometimes we get reports of people heard a pig, or uh, there might be um, somebody found some scat and they think it's feral swine scat um, or bones. 
Um, and so we don't typically go out and investigate those situations only if it's a, a picture or a very good um, report of somebody actually seeing the animal itself. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Obviously sounds, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a feral swine. Scat is very difficult um, unless you're well trained to distinguish scat from a bear or a pig, for instance. And then obviously bones, um, depending on the situation, we might go investigate bones, um, but it, a, a lot of times it's just gonna end up being a, a deer killed by a car. Um, so after we go out and find feral swine and, and it, it is deemed, you know, working with the state of uh, Washington there, they decide let's go in and remove those pigs. These are just kind of the methods that obviously are going to be used. So um, we can go in and we can set up traps. Um, and these traps are, are typically large walk-in traps so that you can catch multiple animals at one time in a, in a big uh, corral trap is what they're called. Um, and then uh, they work on uh, trigger systems, either a trigger door or, you know, now with the high tech uh, boom, you can actually get uh, game cameras like you see in the top left corner that actually control the gate itself. So you can actually call a the number on your phone and it will close that gate, trapping the pigs inside. And, and the benefit of that is you can wait until you get as many animals in that trap at one time as you can before you close the door. Um, and then obviously in, in some states, we will use aerial uh, shooting. So helicopters and fixed wings um, go up and uh, remove pigs from the air. Uh, we use night vision equipment. Uh, a lot of these animals obviously only come out at night. They're fully nocturnal. Uh, and then we can go out uh, in complete darkness with thermal gear and, and remove them with firearms. And then, so you know, they have looked at the other things for feral swine. And in Australia, they use a, an old chemical, which we will never use again here in the United States, called 1080. And they've been researching uh, uh, nitrite, uh, the stuff they preserve hams with. The, uh, it's very toxic, even to humans at, at a certain level. They've been uh, researching a toxicant for feral swine uh, based on nitrates and nitrites. But those have yet, uh, we have not been able to use those in the United States yet. Uh, they are using them in Australia though with some effectiveness. So, um, all right, next slide, Justin. Um, so monitoring, so after we go in and we remove uh, whatever pigs are there, we obviously have to go in and post monitor because if you, if you missed any, uh, it might be several days, weeks, months before they, uh, before you begin to see sign in the same area. So we, we do go back uh, and investigate to see if we begin to see fresh sign or if there are more reports of pigs. And, and we do that by going out and actually physically looking at the ground, looking at new rooting, new tracks, and then obviously we use game. All right, next slide. So um, these maps are, are documenting the, the populations uh, nationwide. So um, these maps are actually updated uh, regularly by the feral swine, uh, um, the National Feral Swine Program upstate, updates these maps and they either add or re will remove some of these highlighted areas depending on what happens with the animals. And, as you can see with Washington, from 2016, we, we had to uh, document that there was a population in the potholes area. And it remained um, until um, uh, 2019 there, where you can see that it's removed. And um, that's because we, we deemed that there were no other pigs in that area and we had got the last one. And so then the, uh, um, the county is removed as having a feral swine population. So that's a good thing, that's a good thing. All right, Justin, next slide. Um, so just to, to point out also uh, what's been occurring um, probably for the last 10 years, I would say, uh, even before the National Swine Program was developed, uh, we were doing feral swine work in many of the states already. It just wasn't a national program yet. 
uh, we began to take genetic samples from these feral swine. Um, and what that began to, what, what the end goal was is basically see how all these uh, feral swine are related because you get so many um, interbreeding between domestic livestock and, and um, animals that are brought in from game farms that are uh, true Eurasian boars. And so we wanted to just follow the genetics um, <laughs> um, throughout the country. And as you can see, it does give us a, a benefit. Um, we're able to go in and see like, you know, are these, are these uh, populations like in Washington, for instance, the one little triangle, are these actual feral swine genetics or are we dealing with just uh, domestic swine genetics? But as you can see, um, you know, you, you get a mix all over the country. I, I, I think it's pretty fascinating just to look at. Um, and then we, we use it for, uh, for, for documenting long-term uh, movement of, of feral swine. All right, next slide, Justin. So this is just a little humor, you know. We always we always say that uh, uh, there's solidarity amongst the animals, and and we're out trying to remove these feral swine. And um, this little guy here is a beaver. Um, he he decided to chew down the one limb that we uh, attached our trail cam to, and uh, thus stopped us from documenting or monitoring that area until we were able to get out there and get that camera moved. But um, you know, the, the beavers, the beavers helping out the pigs and, and vice versa. So we, there's something a little funny, you know, is, is, is the, the beaver, the champion of the pig, I guess the verdict's still out. All right, next slide, Justin. So, and then, and then here, solidarity among animals. Yeah, well, maybe not, because here's the South and I don't know what that pig's doing. He's so deep in that hole rooting around for the corn. Um, I think that alligator's going to have him some pulled pork and, you know, he's got his helper standing outside too, waiting to pick up the scraps when they're done. But uh, um, you can see this alligator was probably just waiting there for a long time for a pig to come in like that. So the, the trappers are going to have a interesting find the next day. Okay, next, next slide. I guess that's the end. So. Thank you. It, it's odd giving a presentation, not being able to look at anybody. Thanks, Brick. I like the beaver slide. It's one of those where you're like, yeah, that just figures. <laughs> That's exactly how that would happen. <laughs> well, at this point, um, we do have a couple questions queued up, but I would invite everybody that's participating today if there was something that you'd like more clarification on, or if you had any questions as we were going through to definitely drop that in the Q&A. And then Justin, did you want to do the code word now or did you want to do it after question and answer? Perfect. Might as well do it now. <laughs> Excellent. So if you are hoping to get a pesticide recertification credit for today's webinar, this is your code word. If you could please type it into the chat. If you are not interested in pesticide recertification, then please feel free to let your attention wander for a minute or two as we collect these. And then the next steps will be, I will say the chat function, um, just to confirm that you were in attendance. And then after this webinar is over, expect an email from me today with some further instructions of how we can confirm you. Perfect. I see chat words going through. Um, we'll give this just another minute or so if people are figuring out where the chat features and things are. Um, but again, you can use the question and answer box or you can just type it in the chat, whichever works for you. Um, while people are responding to the code word, there was one question um, for Brooke. It was the one of the last maps that you showed. It had the pink triangles with the blue splotch background. The genetics map? Yes. Somebody was asking what the colors meant. Can't see it on there, can you? So I I I, I don't want to say it wrong, but I, I believe the um I believe the uh, purple triangles are uh, feral swine genetic background. Sorry, this wasn't my presentation, so I apologize because I, I, I can't answer that question 
the best of my ability. No, that's helpful. Thank you. And again, well, for anybody that I don't think anybody's on the phone. Okay, just make sure to, if you're looking for pesticide recertification credits that you type Wilbur in the chat. If there's anybody on the phone, the code word is Wilbur and you can feel free to email me uh, after the presentation is over today and I'll make sure that you get your credits. Brooke, as a follow-up question, uh, while it's, it's difficult to understand what that image was conveying, are you seeing genetic... Uh, relationships between populations in different states and what does that indicate to you? Yeah, they have. And, and basically what that indicates is probably just large scale translocation. So, you know, there's, there's no doubt, you know, there's a lot of money in feral swine hunting. Um, so uh, it's, it's to people's benefit to get these pigs moved around. So I think when you're seeing, especially over, you know, uh, crossing state lines, uh, we're assuming that those animals are probably being sold, traded, um, you know, from either one game farm to another, or just, you know, from somebody buying a uh, feral swine from say like Texas, uh, a big feral boar to release in, you know, Arkansas where they have, you know, maybe a small population of, of wild pigs. Uh, just to improve, you know, these, these hunters are wanting to improve the genetics of their own pig population or improve by saying like maybe increasing their size or increasing their tusks or making them more wild type pigs. Did that answer your question, Justin? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. So we do have uh, a couple questions in the chat that I want to move to. Um, so for Justin or for Brooke, would you mind speaking a little bit more to the disease risk involved in feral swine? And sure, why you that's... take it first, Brooke. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a big disease risk. So uh, initially when wildlife services started on the, the path to uh, doing feral swine work in general, uh, we work closely with veterinary services because uh, there's like 24 zoonotic diseases that feral swine can carry, um, which can affect, you know, zoonotic, meaning it can uh, affect humans or other animals. Um, and some of the big ones are obviously like swine brucellosis, uh, classical swine fever, all uh, those two diseases are serious threats to uh, domestic livestock in the United States. So uh, in most of these feral swine removals, uh, we are sending off samples for testing. Great, well, thank you. I, I'm by no means uh, a veterinarian, but sometimes I get tasked to answer, like play one on webinars. <laughs> and uh, to my understanding, uh, Brooke's absolutely right. Uh, pigs are considered a reservoir species and that they can host a, a myriad of different viruses and diseases. And um, part of the trouble with feral swine is they may be moving from one area to another. And so you may have biosecurity practices in place on your, um, on your ranch, but if feral swine are moving from one to another, they can be the vector for moving diseases from one population to another. And so there's a huge disease risk and um, some of the presentations that, that we uh, receive and briefings from uh, foreign animal disease experts are pretty terrifying. Some things that we don't have like African swine fever have almost a 100% mortality for domestic pigs. And so um, feral swine certainly could be a huge problem uh, for our agriculture. And I'll let Brooke finish that off if he has more to add. Nope, I, sounds good. Thank you both. Um, we have another question. I think this is in regards to controlling. Um, are the feds taking action against states who allow hunting? Shouldn't it be outlawed and then strictly have the federal state, whoever the agency is responsible for them, use sharpshooters to eradicate rather than having like a, a hunting operation? Sure. So it sounds simple like that to, to just go in and say you can't hunt feral swine, um, but there, there's a lot of problems in doing that. Uh, you know, you can ban it, but then you have to enforce it. 
uh, and and basically these are state regulations, not federal regulations. So hunting has to do, you know, the states make their own hunting regulations. So in some states they have banned feral swine hunting altogether. We found that that doesn't necessarily meant, uh, doesn't necessarily work. Uh, it depends on how the laws are written. We could go, we could talk about this for a long time because it gets very complex when you start getting into laws. But um, basically, if you if you outlaw hunting and it doesn't prevent people from bringing them in, and then a lot of times in the state laws they will outlaw hunting um, as you know a state thing. They don't permit it, but if you see a feral swine, you can shoot it. And that encourages then the release of pigs because then you have a, an animal that's not regulated but can be shot at any time. And this is a game species. Um, so to get back to the question, should, should feral swine hunting be outlawed? Well, that's a state by state issue. You're not gonna get support in a lot of states that this is a cultural aspect. You know, that these are animals who have been grown, released, and hunted in some of these states for, you know, a hundred years. Um, so to go in there and change that is, is just going to be very difficult to do. You're going to get a lot of backlash. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it, it's difficult for the feds just to come in and blanket say you can't hunt feral swine. I don't know, Justin, you can add from your state experience. Yeah, and this, this is where um, the Washington Invasive Species Council uh, comes in in terms of interagency uh, feral swine response coordination. At the state level, the state laws uh, are split between the Washington State Department of Agriculture as well as our Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, there's requirements for importation of uh, livestock, including pigs, and so that would be uh, introducing feral swine to Washington would be under our Department of Agriculture, as well as our fencing laws are underneath our Department of Agriculture's uh, purview. Uh, whereas feral swine being on the ground, they're considered deleterious wildlife. And, um, and so our State Department of Fish and Wildlife comes in. And so feral swine essentially are um, illegal in the state of Washington. You can't bring them in, they can't be on the ground. Um, and uh, we work together between the state agencies uh, to coordinate a response um, with the assistance from U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, is, uh, as Brooke explained, showing the maps, our, our system appears to be working. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, we have no established feral swine in Washington today. Um, we've had them in the past, but through working together, we've been able to uh, more or less eradicate them uh, when we find them. So it's a great success story. And um, I think really shows, you know, it clearly uh, shows that if we work together for common goals, we, we can be successful in this field. Thank you both. Um, this is another can kind I, of- Can I just say one other thing about that, about hunting? Yeah. The, the other reality is like, if you, if you stop uh, all boot on the ground hunters, just your recreational hunters, you're, you're also gonna lose out on a, a large portion of removal of those animals. So um, there is a benefit, um, even though they do tend to translocate, you know, not every hunter translocates pigs. And so you, you get a huge um, benefit of people going out hunt, recreational hunting and removing these animals. And they may do that during other seasons, because typically they are considered invasive species in most states and you can remove pig at any time if you're out hunting deer for instance and you see a feral swine you could take it. Um, so there is a benefit to having the, the hunting even though on the side there's these other problems of translocation. I guess we're betting it back and forth. So to, to jump on that, um, you know, that was our experience that we saw in Grant County historically, uh, where there were uh, probably domestics that escaped and went feral uh, on a state wildlife area. And um, some really well-meaning individuals uh, didn't report it properly through the squeal and pigs hotline and, um, and took, um, took the opportunity to go out and, and try to eradicate them themselves. And um, got one, and it was a, a pregnant sow, which was a good one to get if you're, if you're going to take one. 
But the rest of the sounder, which is a group of pigs, um, saw that and they became fearful of humans. And then it took us, what, three years, Brooke, to eradicate the rest? Because Correct. It, at that point, they were aware that they were being hunted. And, and um, can you speak more to that, Brooke? Yeah, sure. That that happens a lot of times uh, with, you know, particularly sounders, uh, you know, the, which is a, typically a sounder is a group of females and all their offspring. The, the males leave once they grow up. But for those of you wondering what a sounder is, it's, a, it's typically a large group of, of females. Uh, so it's going to be sisters and daughters and then all their piglets. And it, it can be very large, 20, 40 pigs. Um, and so we do see this. Sometimes if you go in and you, you shoot one pig out of a sounder, the sounder responds and it can push the sounder great distances sometimes uh, as they flee to find a safer area. So yeah, that part of hunting also can be a problem just as Justin was saying. And we've seen it many, many times. It also can uh, cause problems for trapping because you know pigs are smart animals. They're very intelligent. So uh, going in and just shooting one sometimes can mess up your whole trapping routine and everything. So uh, when when we come into a, a feral swine operation, uh, we start slow instead of just pulling out guns and starting to remove pigs because you can you can cause problems for yourself uh, during the removal. So no, very good point, Justin brought up. Yeah, not, not at all, you know, to say that hunting is not a part of the solution. In my mind, it's a critical component. I mean, our goal in Washington State is awareness. We want everyone out in the field to be aware and to say something if they see it. And, um, you know, hunters are most likely probably to run into some of these things first. Um, what we don't want is, is to uh, cause a, a problem by shooting one and, and then having the rest run from us. Um, but if they say something, then we can um, convene a response team and Sometimes that, that's included the public in the past. Historically in the Wainuichi River Valley, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, engaged with um, master hunters and, and which are essentially volunteer members of the public to assist in, in that eradication. And we do believe it was an eradication. So, um, you know, we, we all really do have a role to play and, um, and hunters certainly, you know, have a role as well. Thank you. So this question, I feel like you both have kind of answered it, but to just plain talk it directly, are the public allowed to remove swine or do they have to contact USDA? So I guess this would be a good opportunity to kind of talk about what happens when feral swine is detected and who talks to who. Why don't you take that one, Justin? Okay. <laughs> That's a good, a good question. Um, Br Brooke mentioned there's a handful of states where it's legal to shoot feral swine, and, and that's uh, true in Washington. Uh, they are unclassified wildlife uh, by our State Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, I believe that if you have a small game license, you can take a feral swine if you, if you see one. And so, um, you know, assuming you're in an area where you can hunt legally, for example. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, we definitely in the past have had the public help us with feral swine removal. Um, we just need to be aware, like thinking about the whole of Washington, that our goal is eradication and um, recreational hunting is not going to get us to eradication in most instances. Uh, tools and techniques and um, really kind of like uh, things that you do as an ethical hunter are not necessarily uh, what we're out for. We're out for complete eradication, which means we want every one of them gone. And, um, and so there's things that wildlife services will do, for example, or the State Department of Fish and Wildlife that um, wouldn't be allowed for recreational hunting. Um, do you want to, and that goes to like the infrared and things like that. Do you want to talk more about that, Brooke? Yeah, I, I guess you, you covered it. And yeah, we were allowed to use a lot more techniques in a lot of different areas where your, you know, regular hunter wouldn't be allowed to do that. So a lot of times you're getting feral swine in areas that are uh, unhuntable areas. They're, you know, in, in basically the urban interface. Uh, it, this isn't out in, you know, except for the one case, I guess uh, the potholes was pretty remote, but, um, and the Okanagan uh, or the, the one down in the National Forest was pretty remote, but most of the ones on the, the west side over here are, uh, 
you know, in and around where people live. So they're, they're never going to be part of a huntable population. Um, and then we can come in and yeah, we have thermal equipment. Um, plus we're, we're trained to do this work. And as Justin said, we're not, we're not here for recreational hunting. This is our job to remove the animals. Great. Well, we, we talked about kind of the case study of the historic Grant County population, but the Gifford Pinchot group that, um, that Brooke spoke about really was a good contrast to that. And um, numerous members of the public reported uh, some pigs that were uh, intentionally released on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. I believe more than five miles um, onto the national forest around a, a rock pit. And um, rather than, um, you know, well-meaning person that, that certainly could have um, exercised their right to hunt, if you could hunt in that area, um, they reported it and sent us photos. And actually there were some photos in the presentation of those pigs yeah. um, walking along the Forest Service Road. And through that investigation and response, um, the Invasive Species Council and the U.S. Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services went out to look and, and see if we could find them. And um, in that one uh, day of investigation, they were actually found and uh, USDA uh, eradicated them uh, that, that single day. And so that's really what we want is to have a coordinated response um, where there's multiple swine and a boom, 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 they're all gone. The, there's no more problem. And, um, and then we then verified that through long-term monitoring. So um, that's, that's really a great success story. And actually we dodged a huge problem because that was really wooded area. Um, so like helicopter flights wouldn't have been possible. And, um, and that would have really limited the tools at hand. And um, if you envision the map of Oregon and Washington up to British Columbia, there's the national forest system. And, um, and this was kind of plumbed in the middle of it in Washington State. So it, it could have been kind of a feral swine superhighway uh, through our forest lands. And so um, huge thanks to USDA for, for stopping that. Perfect. And I think, Brooke, this next question is for you. I think it's in regards to when you were talking about the different ways that um, USDA eradicates the feral swine. Um, this person said, you indicated that 1080 won't be used in the U.S. for control of swine populations. Are there other baits being considered in areas where there are large, well-established populations? Yeah, so the, the only uh, toxicant that they are looking at now is the, the nitrite or nitrate-based toxicants. And that's the uh, salt solution, you know, that they use to preserve hams. And it's, it's very toxic to uh, all, all, you know, humans as well. It's toxic. Um, but you have to get a certain amount for it to be toxic. And uh, pigs have a low uh, tolerance for, for nitrates or nitrites. And, and they can get into this, they can go over the hump, they say, of the, the toxicity level. And once you get over that hump, you can't come back. Um, the problem is that's toxic to all animals. So the, um, the biggest issue with using that um, for feral swine is making a delivery system that other animals can't get into. And that, that's been the biggest issue I think that there has been with that is uh, they've, they've tried to develop things that are unique that only pigs can open, but we have other animals like bears and raccoons. And we found over time, um, even making a, a ruder contraption that forces the pig to use its snout to open a thing to allow bait to come out. Raccoons have eventually figured out how to open those. Even if it takes multiple raccoons working together, they do it to get those out. And so the issue would then be obviously non-targets. So um, although that, that toxicant is available, the biggest issue is being able to, to utilize it without having non-targets. So, but as far as I know, that's the only toxicant that they are even thinking about using for feral swine. So uh, obviously 1080 was an extremely toxic chemical that was outlawed in the United States, you know, decades ago, and that would never come back. 
Thank you. I think we've got time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, this one is, has there been any push to mark all pigs to identify feral swine? And the example was like you do with shrimp and crab pots. Like mark them, I assume like a tag. Yeah, something. And Carrie, feel free to elaborate in the chat, but I'm assuming is, is there a way to mark pigs so if they become feral swine, you can then track them back to where they came from, I think oh, is the gotcha. question. Gotcha. If I'm wrong, so, Carrie, please clarify. Or a tattoo, she said. A tattoo gotcha. or a tag. So um, the problem is they're feral swine and you would, you would have to capture a pig to do that. And if they're feral swine and we capture them, they're just going to be removed. Um, then it, guarding them or something from the air, you have to realize there, I think the estimated population is, you know, Justin, is it like 3 million or that might only be in Texas, 1.5 million pigs in Texas. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not current on the stats. I know there's at least 2 million in the state of Texas. Um, the national number, I'm not sure. Um, A lot. It, yeah, if you have, I know that there's a new, new-ish uh, livestock um, marking program that our State Department of Agriculture um, leads, and I, I'm not sure the spectrum of types of livestock. So maybe um, put your email address in the chat, and um, and I can try to connect you with the folks with our State Department of uh, Agriculture if 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 it does apply to to domestic pigs anyway. Um, but on that note, Brooke, can you talk about Judas pigs? Uh, that's sure. kind of like marking in a way. <laughs> it, it is. It is. So yeah, Judas pigs. So so we do use this occasionally, but it's 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 not it it's to find where all the other pigs go. Because sometimes uh, if you're working like uh, the example in the the national forest, if you get in an area that's very dense um, and the pigs have a lot of area to use. Uh, it's it's sometimes hard to find where those pigs go. And so uh, the case of a Judas pig, we call it, will actually catch preferably a young pig so that it's going to hang out with a founder and uh, the mom. Um, and we will put a, a tracking device on it, typically a net collar. Um, and then that way we can follow where those pigs go. But the end game is to find out the movements of those pigs so that we can get in and you know, attempt eradication. So uh, sometimes if it's, if you're having a difficult time, time trapping the pigs, they'll, they'll use a Judas pig to find out maybe better areas to get into and set traps where you might have uh, better luck trapping them. Um, but I will say like a, a lot of the, the, the game farms that exist in the United States, uh, they're required typically by law if they have any sort of Russian boar um, or Eurasian boars that they breed there, um, they are required to tag them by law. So we, we have in some cases caught tagged pigs, you know, not in Washington, this would be other states where we have caught tagged pigs that have escaped from game farms and, and those can be traced back to that game farm and they do that. Um, but as wildlife services were non-regulatory, so again, that typically falls on to the state agriculture department. Thank you. And that's kind of a good segue. So I did get clarification on that question. Um, what they were asking is since most of the feral swine, um, at least in the Pacific Northwest, are newly feral, like they escaped a fence or they got out of a plot, is there a way on the front end to mark them. So if and when they escape whatever their fenced agriculture situation was, by whatever marking it is, you can then trace it back to the farmer and let them know like, hey, maybe your fence is wrong. We found this pig here. Is, is there any system like that in place? I, I wouldn't know, Justin can make, I think Justin was hitting on it earlier, but Justin would be able to answer that better. Yeah, not, not to my knowledge, although I'm not up to speed on, on that new uh, Department of Agriculture program. And, and so definitely put your, your email address in the, the chat log and, and we can try to follow up. Uh, we have in the past discussed uh, maybe some, some policy fixes such as mandatory reporting. Like if someone loses a pig, uh, for example, uh, if, if you're a farmer and you realize you're missing a pig or multiple pigs that you need to report it, 
to our hotline within a certain period of time. Um, but currently there's no requirement to do that. Really, it's um, kind of that passive monitoring that each and every one of us plays um, by looking on our windows, if we're going on a hike, keeping our eyes peeled. Um, and if you see any pig out of captivity, whether it's Wilbur, the code word, friendly pig, or, um, or a little potbelly pig, or really a, a snarling kind of tusk boar, uh, they're all feral swine in Washington if they're out of captivity. Um, and, and free range. So um, whatever it looks like, if you see a pig and it's not in fencing, uh, call us up and let us know. Perfect. Well, we have one minute left. So if you want, had any closing statements or any last information that either Brooke or Justin you wanted to give the audience, um, we'll be wrapping up here in just a minute. I don't have anything, Justin. Um, yeah, I guess uh, this is one of the more interesting invasive species because they're not present in Washington. And, um, and so it's hard, hard to convey the threat in a lot of ways because they're not here and we don't see that damage. And so the, the slides that the Brooks showed showing that national um, impact, you know, just imagine that in the state of Washington, that rooting and that tilling of the soil. Uh, we've got a lot of riparian areas, wetlands, Kind of sensitive kind of ha salmon habitat right and and we we, we could face a significant loss um, of, of our um, our environmental resources so it's up to each and every one of us to do our part and prevent it from happening happy invasive species awareness week everyone <laughs> <laughs> perfect yes well thank you there just you to go. piggyback off that pun intended i've been waiting all week to use that i'm so excited <laughs> If you're looking for any more information or you want to learn more about the Squeal on Pigs campaign or you want to learn more about some of the webinars we're going to be featuring this week, I would highly encourage you to go visit our website. Um, there's tons of great information in there. And if you had any uh, information that you want to know specifically, feel free to email me or Justin or Brooke or leave us a message in the chat and we will get back to you. But I just wanted to thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us to learn a little bit more about this problem in Washington. So happy Invasive Species Awareness Week and Hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks everybody, bye.